speaker is going to be Rob Laidlaw, and while it might be very entertaining to make him read his own bio, we thought maybe I'd do it. So, uh, Rob Laidlaw is the founder and executive director of ZooCheck. He's been an activist for more than 40 years. He's been employed professionally in the field for 29 years. He gives assistance to groups all around the world, and in the past 15 years has assisted with a broad range of animal protection initiatives throughout Asia. He's a chartered biologist, which means self-taught, he taught himself everything, a former Humane Society inspector, past project manager for the World Society for the Protection of Animals. He's also the award-winning author of, oh, there must be, oh. of nine children's books about animal welfare and wildlife protection, numerous book chapters, reports, and materials. In 2014, he was awarded the Frederick, the Frederick A. McGrand Lifetime Achievement Award for significant contributions to animal welfare. And since they've given the lawyer a mic, I'm going to take the liberty of saying, um, Rob is one of the, also one of, it's not written here actually, one of the most admirable men you'll ever meet. He wants no acclaim, he wants no attention. I'm, I think he probably is as horrified to stand up here as, as Julie was. I think he was lying about seeing movies. I don't think he ever actually goes out, because he's always at work. Whenever you call, he's there. Whatever information you want, he's got, or he's going to provide it in the next five minutes. I think he's been to more zoos than anybody else in the world. He forces them to go, and he really doesn't want any acclaim or thanks for it. He just really wants to make the changes that we're all talking about today. So I'm looking forward to hearing about what lessons he's learned in that course. I was going to introduce myself, but I thought it would be a bit Austin Powers to allow myself to introduce myself. <laughs> uh, thanks, Leslie. It's, yeah, it, it, it is always embarrassing, I think, for all of us when people read nice things about you. Um, it's not something we actively seek or anything, but it, I guess it's nice to hear it once in a while that people that are paying attention or do appreciate the efforts that are being made. Now, since we came up with the 8 uh, by Ten idea and question about what's the most important lesson I've learned inside I've gained or idea I've come up with to make the world a better place. I've really struggled with how, how do you sort of whittle it down and identify one that rises above the others. I find, found it an almost impossible task and this afternoon I'm sitting at my desk saying, what am I going to say? How, how do I do this? There's so, so many things I've learned since I started. And uh, you know, I found it to be an excruciatingly difficult process. To Try to, try to do that, just figure out one. So I decided I wanted to, instead of mentioning one, just mention two. I don't want to take the liberty of uh, mentioning more because the theme is, what have you learned? But I, I wanted to mention two that I think are important, and I believe they apply in every person's uh, personal life, school life, professional life, and in the political arena. The first is what I call intelligent perseverance. We've heard a lot about perseverance, and perseverance is a a very, very good quality for people that want to affect change to have. Uh, but I like to think that what we really need and what we should strive for is intelligent perseverance with the emphasis on intelligence. And the reason I say that is that throughout the past uh, almost four decades of doing this work, I've encountered many wonderful, dedicated, caring, sincere people who want nothing more than to make the world a better place for animals, and in some cases for the environment or for other people, of course, as well. But I found that many of those people over the years engage in activities that make them feel better, but that have virtually no chance of ever changing the way that animals in our society are treated. And I've also found that many of those people don't engage in any degree of self-analysis and looking back at what they're doing to try to actually determine if what they're doing has any effect at all. Now, a long time ago when I first started, uh, I remember I uh, helped form a group. We had this intense, very robust program of protests and, and public awareness events and all, all these other kinds of sort of uh, stereotypical activities that you would think of when you think of animal welfare groups and animal rights groups. And we were doing major events every year, some of them attracting one or two thousand people. There was a lot of momentum, a lot of popularity for these events. And at the end of a year of doing those, I realized, well, what have we accomplished? 
And nobody could tell me what we had accomplished. There was this amorphous, well, maybe we educated people, or maybe we, maybe we affected change here or there, but nobody really knew. And for me, personally, I thought, that's not good enough. You know, we need to know what we're doing. We need to know that we are being effective, because if we're not, why bother? Shortly after that, this was, and this was about 30 years ago, uh, I became interested in the fight zoo animals in Ontario. And I attended, as one of my first actions, a meeting of the Wildlife Committee of the Ontario SPCA. And during the six months that I was a member of this committee, their entire uh, suite of activities with regard to trying to help animals in zoos in Ontario, consisted of one letter to the Minister of the time, the Minister of the Natural Resources, and that letter had never received an answer. And they decided, since that was not successful, that they would then try to write another letter. And I suspect another letter, and another letter, and another letter. And I thought to myself, well, there's got to be more. This isn't effective. And why would you keep repeating the same thing over and over again and expect a different result? And I wanted to show you just a, a quote from someone you all know. Uh, nobody really knows if Einstein said this, at least not in these words, but it's uh, popularly uh, attributed to him. Uh, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And I encountered this very early on, and this was one of the phenomena that I uh, experienced firsthand on this wildlife committee. And I thought, well, this sucks. I've got to do something else. And I ended up going off and do, doing a bunch of other activities. And in fact, the CEO of the Ontario Community Society at the time said, well, yeah, the wildlife committee, I, they're not going to do it. Nobody's going to do it. You're, if some, something's going to happen, you're going to have to do it. And I said, uh, sure, I'll do it, no problem. Uh, I naively thought it would take 18 months. <laughs> now, 33 years later, we're getting closer. Uh, if we hadn't had lots of other successes in other jurisdictions and other parts of the world, I think we would have all gone crazy. Certainly, I would have. But, you know, the Wildlife Committee was a, a very sobering experience for me. And during the time since, since the Wildlife Committee days, uh, I've also met a multitude of other people conducting an annual protests for fur, annual protests for circuses, annual protests for a number of, uh, any number of other issues. And the people generally come together for a few hours per year. Uh, they may chant or show signs, get the picture in the local paper. Uh, they pat themselves on the back and then they go home and they forget about it until next year. And they keep coming back year after year after year doing the same thing. And to me, that's Einstein's definition of insanity. They keep coming back and doing the same thing again and again and again, and they never get any results, but they expect you. And this is something that I think is uh, ubiquitous amongst the animal movement in North America. Today, thousands and thousands of people are involved in all kinds of protests and public awareness events that are not overtly and specifically designed to support a wider more strategic initiative. People come, it's a great social event. You know, maybe a few people learn something, they chant, and then they go home. These are often isolated events with no discernible goals or targets, which doesn't make any sense to me, because I think if you're uh, intelligent and pursuing uh, something that you want to be effective, then you would want there to be a goal to what you're doing so that you can or whether or not you're moving forward to that goal or reaching that goal. For many participants, a lot of these activities are the end point. The activities themselves, they attend the process, they go home, and they feel better about it. Well, I ch challenge people uh, on that quite a bit. I <coughs> want to see people think differently about those kinds of activities. After all these years, I honestly believe uh, in the early days that by now, we would have a very sophisticated and more effective movement, but I'm profoundly disappointed by what's been happening, especially in recent years. So I believe one of the most important lessons I've learned was one of the first lessons I learned. For the sake of the animals, we need to persevere, <coughs> of course. We need to persevere in our personal lives, at school, at work, and in the political arena. But, and it's a huge, huge but, we have to be smart about it. We have to learn from our mistakes and failures. We have to be our absolutely most horrendous, worst critics of ourselves. We have to look for evidence that what we're doing is actually achieving something. And if there's no evidence, we should stop doing it and do something else. That is not something that happens in this movement, or not very much, not as much as it should. 
And if we don't do these things, we're letting the animals down. So like I said earlier, we go home, we go to movies, we play with our kids, we go to work. Animals don't get those choices and those opportunities. Now there's one other important lesson I mentioned to you earlier that I want, want to talk about. And that's, you've got to have fun doing this stuff. It's depressing to think about animals. And there's a quote that I often use by David Brower. He was one of the sort of founders of the American and modern American environmental movement. He founded, or was a co-founder of the Sierra Club, and then he went on later to found a fantastic organization called the Earth Island Institute. And he said, every single day, we deal with deadly serious subjects, but we should never, ever make the mistake of taking them seriously. And I think that's something that everybody should take to heart. There's actually a lot to laugh at when you're involved in this work. Uh, Julie and I have dealt with many interesting people over the years, and I just wanted to mention a few of them. We dealt with this one guy who was an exact replica of the Jim Carrey character in the movie Dumb and Dumber. And everything he said was backwards. And he was starting a zoo, and we fought him and fought him, and he lost. And eventually he was re arrested for starting a marijuana grow up on his property. <laughs> Crazy character. Well, he had a friend that we also dealt with that was a giant. And, and I mean, he was a real giant. Uh, he freaked Julie out. Uh, <laughs> and he wore this uh, silk taffeta suit that I think was purple. And he would show up at council meetings as the director of education. And we were thinking, this, this is crazy. And he drove this big modified Harley Davidson and he used to be a professional wrestler. And you know, how did you get more fun than that? You know, there was a lady who frequently appeared with a monkey on her head. There were other people we dealt with that believed that they were from some far distant, gal distant galaxy. All kinds of crazy characters. Like, you can't make this stuff up. This is fun. But I can tell you, and it's even more fun meeting them, but I can tell you that what's most fun, and we ascertain this kind of stuff through uh, uh, conversations with informants through freedom of information requests and all that. What's most fun in all of this is finding out how much we're making the lives of the people who use, abuse, and exploit animals miserable. <laughs> you know, there is nothing better. I think we got an FOI just the other day where you know we can see the misery that's just oozing from the pages, from their statements and all that. That's fun. This work <laughs> is fun. You know. <laughs> Uh, and, and like I said, it's even more fun if you win and if you have this intelligent perseverance. I think many of us have proven that you can win. Not all the time, but you, you can win. And I know at this stage in the game, for, for us at Suchek, we win more than we lose. That's, that's a profound difference, a sea change from many years ago. So my two lessons are learn to enjoy the struggle. I call it enjoy the fight, find the humor. And the second lesson, of course, which I mentioned first, is always think about intelligent perseverance.